Well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. If you're able to stand with me, page 488. 48, he keeps me singing. Amen. All right, you can be seated this morning. Thank you, Mark, for leading us in that great hymn. And uh, Jesus is certainly the sweetest name that I know, and it's at his name. One of these days, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he's Lord. And so I trust that you know him this morning as Lord and Savior, that you have been saved by his blood, and that you have a relationship with him. If not, today could be the greatest day of your life as you say an everlasting yes to Jesus Christ. Let me make a few announcements, and we'll move forward into our service this morning. Uh, first of all, visitors, especially first-time visitors, thank you for being here. We are honored that you are, have chose to worship with us today, and we hope you feel right at home and welcome here at Parkwood Baptist Church. Uh, in front of you or close to you, there'll be a connection card in the seat back. Take that and fill it out, and uh, we'd love a record of your visit. It's our way of praying for you and, and uh, reaching back out to to thank you for coming and seeing us. So keep that in mind. Help us out with that if you can. Ladies, this week you have a Bible study on Thursday, June the 13th. This is the sixth and final session of this particular Bible study. And, uh, and so that's Thursday at 9.30. You'll wrap that, that study up on the book of Jude. And so keep that in mind. Thursday, 9.30. Uh, see Miss Luann Shepherd for any questions there. Next Sunday is Father's Day. And, uh, and so... Just to remind you of that, next Sunday, June 16th is Father's Day. We will honor every, uh, every dad in the service that, that Sunday. Of Sunday school at 10, worship at 11, no evening service on Father's Day. Uh, we dismiss that as we do on Mother's Day to give you an opportunity to spend some time with your family. 
And so keep that in mind. Next Sunday, no evening service. Um, coming up on uh, the last Sunday of this month on June 30th, Evangelist Mike Courtney. Brother Mike Courtney will be preaching in both services, morning and evening for us. And, uh, and so be here, be in prayer for Brother Mike. Uh, he is an evangelist um, from here in Texas. He's been here on multiple occasions, does a tremendous job preaching God's Word. I'll be in Pine Ridge, South Dakota with uh, Brother Ken Trivet on that Sunday preaching there their uh, anniversary Sunday there on the Indian Reservation, the church that he planted there um, 12, 13 years ago. I think it's 13 this year. And so uh, certainly certainly we'll miss each of you, but you'll be in great hands under Brother Mike Courtney. He's a tremendous expositor of God's Word. And then coming up in July, we hadn't released these dates until this morning, but uh, mark this down, Vacation Bible School will be July 22nd through the 26th. Start at 9 o'clock in the morning each morning and, and go through noon, so 9 a.m. to noon. And, uh, and then there's a commencement on Friday night at 7 p.m. Registration upcoming for kindergarten through fifth grade. So keep that in mind. But those are the dates you need to mark down, 22nd through the 26th. All right. I don't know of any other announcements. Um, we do have one birthday that I'm aware of, and it's a pretty important one. Uh, Mallory Smith, Rory Smith, has a birthday, her third birthday, uh, tomorrow on June the 10th. And so happy birthday to Rory. She's in, in nursery this morning, so, so you won't be able to sing to her right now. But when you see her, you tell her happy birthday. I'm sure she'll appreciate that. You hadn't met Rory. She runs this place, all right? And uh, it's her world, and you are privileged to live in it. And, uh, and uh, she... She's precious. I love her. Happy birthday to Rory. Happy third birthday. Mark, let's, uh, let's get back into our song service this morning. We had a birthday party for her yesterday, and she just had a wonderful time. And so Brian and my brother Matthew and them decided to keep on uh, doing their thing until she started crying. So it was her birthday, and she'll cry if she wants to. <laughs> Well, remain seated. Let's turn in our hymn books to page 201. Grace greater than all our sins. Turn to page 234. 
Page 234, crown him with many crowns. will come at this time we will take our morning tithes and offerings and trust that you'll give as God has prospered you in accordance to his word this morning Timo why don't you lead us in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless this offering
Joni and I have a tangled mess up here. Y'all can't see it. It's hidden, but it's uh, there's cords just all binded together. <laughs> well, Miss Shar, that was beautiful. I, I don't think y'all can see what me and Joni could see, but her feet were down here dancing the <laughs> entire time. See, she's got a she's like got like piano keys on the floor that she's using her feet, and they're just moving and hitting all the bass notes. And then she has two keyboards up here on this organ, and she's playing the bottom one on the, during, the, during the verses. But when she gets to that chorus, she's using both of them. And I'm like, How to, that's like juggling. It looks so difficult, Miss Shar, and it was beautiful. <laughs> but I'm thankful that Jesus is coming again as she was, as she was playing. We're going to sing one we haven't sang since December. I think it's the last time we did it. And I have so much to be thankful for, but nothing more that I could be thankful for than that Jesus, he would come for me. Amen. The goal that separated me from Christ my Lord. It was so vast, the crossing I could never fold. From where I was to his domain, it seemed so far I cry dear Lord I cannot come to where you are he came to me chains of my sin. He came to me when I possessed no hope within. He picked me up and drew me gently to his side.
Thank you, Mark and Joni, for that. Singing. A great song written by Squire Parsons. And uh, excellent job on that. He came to me. That's one of the greatest truths found in all of the Bible is that God would come to mankind. And uh, you would be you would be helplessly and hopelessly lost apart from that truth. Judges chapter number two this morning. The book of Judges chapter number two. Two weeks ago we started a series in the book of Judges on Sunday mornings and we will pick back up this morning. Now last week we dealt with the whole first chapter. We'll slow down a bit starting this morning and not, not do that very often. We'll read the first five verses momentarily in the book of Judges. Now as I've said each time that we have uh, each, each Sunday that we've been in this study, that the entire Bible is a testament to Christ. Um, if you recall, that Jesus told his disciples on the Emmaus Road that all scriptures testify of him. And, uh, and so the big story of this Bible is there's one hero, his name is Jesus Christ, and he came to this earth to redeem fallen mankind. Now, some scriptures are easier to see that, uh, than others, but you'll find in the book of Judges a repeated cycle. Uh, it's often called the sin cycle. It begins with sin, leads to suffering. At some point there will be supplication, and then God will come and, uh, and, and rescue and save. But the salvation that comes through an earthly judge that you find in the book of Judges will never last, and it will never compare to the eternal salvation that's provided by the eternal Son of God. Now, the book of Judges is filled with bloody pages and, and uh, pages that are filled with rebellion and wickedness and, and sin. And it's against the backdrop of those pages that we realize that we do need a king uh, to come. And those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, we can certainly say emphatically that our king has come. And really the Bible is a story itself of a coming king. Uh, the Old Testament says he's coming, the Gospels say he has come, and the rest of the New Testament, the epistles and such, let us know that he's coming again. It, this really is the book of a coming king. And here, we're in the Old Testament pages that picture and uh, largely prophesy of his first coming, and this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ will be on very, very clear display. Um, you will be able to see him as clearly as as on, as on any page in the book of Judges. Now, I admit there are some portions of Scripture in the book of Judges and some pages in the book of Judges that we'll have to look a little harder to see him, but not so this morning. In Judges chapter number 2, we see the Lord in his pre-incarnate state as easy as, uh, as we can see the noonday sun. He's here in the form of a confronting Christ. Uh, he's here on Judges chapter number 2 as a rebuking redeemer. Here in the opening of Judges chapter 2, you have the chief justice of heaven's supreme court uh, very, very clearly seen. It's Judge Jesus on the bench, and court is in session, and he's going to confront the nation of Israel. Now, I don't like to be confronted. What about you? Um, as a matter of fact, I, I, one of the responsibilities, if I can use that term, that I have that I probably dislike the most is the idea of from time to time having to confront someone about an issue or a problem or, or, or sin. I, I don't enjoy that, largely because it rarely goes well. Uh, oh, it may go well in person, but you give it a few days and you'll find out that it really didn't go well at all. Um, I, I don't like confrontation no more than anyone. And I think that if you enjoy confronting people or you enjoy being confronted, you're not wired right, all right? Uh, but this, na this morning, the nation of Israel is confronted in their sin. They're confronted in their sin. But it's not a confrontation from someone in their Sunday school class, and it's not a confrontation from perhaps a pastor. It's not a confrontation from a Christian co-worker or a concerned family member or friend. In, in fact, this confrontation is not from a mere mortal man at all. Israel is confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, right from the beginning, let's, uh, let's get some theological things taken care of. And so don't, don't be upset with what I'm about to say. Um, I don't know what version you're using this morning. It's none of my business. But I want to clarify something from the beginning. The authorized version, which I'm using, calls this messenger in verse number one an angel of the Lord. 
this is not an angel of the Lord. This is the angel of the Lord. This is none other than an appearance of Jesus Christ, uh, the angel of the Lord. Now, most of the time when you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, and that's what you have this morning. As a matter of fact, let's get into the text. I want you to notice the first person pronouns attributing the work of God to this angel to clarify what I mean. Notice what the Bible says, and an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, and notice what the angel says, I, I made you to go up out of Egypt, and I have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers, and I said, I'll never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land, you shall uh, throw down their altars, you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord, got it right there, spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochum, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. We'll stop our reading there this morning. This angel of the Lord is testifying that he made a covenant with Israel. He says very clearly, it was I that, that uh, brought you up out of Egypt. It was I that promised the land of Canaan to you. I, 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 no mere angel would have done such a thing. Now, it is beyond the scope of this message this morning, but let me suffice it to say that Jesus Christ has always existed. If you have a problem with that being Jesus, Jesus has always existed. He was not created in, Bethle in Bethlehem. He is the uncreated creator of all things. And at various times in the Old Testament history, he appeared unto mankind in the form and the appearance of an angel, and that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ does in this text. And as he appears to them, he is, he is confronting Israel in their sin. And as he does so, and as we read it, you and I would be wise to listen to his holy rebuke. We would be wise to see if there is any count of this indictment that, that may be laid as a charge against us. Now, lean in and listen real carefully to what I'm about to say and what I'm about to ask. Nothing will be as good of a measure to your Christian maturity then asking yourself this question, how do I respond when Jesus confronts me about my disobedience? How do I typically respond when Jesus gets in my business and confronts me about my sin? Notice three simple things about our Lord's confrontation, his statement to Israel. Number one, there is compassion in this statement. I'm talking about the love of God. Paul rightly said in the book of Romans that God demonstrated his love for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But may I remind you this morning that that is not the only way that God demonstrates his love for his people. It's no doubt the preeminent way, I believe. It's no doubt, in my opinion, the greatest way. But it's not the only way. It's not. Most people who think that God is not a God of wrath and a God of anger, but only a God of love, have apparently forgotten, if they ever even knew, that whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. The compassion of Jesus Christ is clearly on display in this Old Testament uh, portion of Scripture. Can I just say that anybody who thinks there's no mercy in the Old Testament clearly has not read the Old Testament very well? Most people look at a passage like this and they rush to the harsh word of discipline and rebuke without stopping to consider the fact that God's mercy is on display simply in the fact that he came to them and communicated with them. I don't know if a song was sung in this confrontation with Jesus Christ, but if it was, it might have been this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for his whoopings tell me so. <laughs> He'll put me in my place. That's one way he shows his grace. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. His spankings tell me so. How do we see the compassion of God in this text? Two, re two ways we see it. Number one, in the fact that he sought after them. 
You'll notice that the text never said that disobedient Israel, rebellious Israel, went seeking after the angel of the Lord. Rather, God took the initiative. And Mark just sang it. Joni just sang it. Uh, And it's true in every area of life. God always takes the initiative. The moment that you find yourself thinking that you are moving towards God, perhaps you are, but friend, it's because God was first moving toward you. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. The hymn writer put it real well. He said, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. And friend, if you're of the redeemed this morning, if you're saved this morning, it's because the one that bought you first sought you. And that, dear friend, is compassion. And it's been that way since the very beginning. When Adam sinned in the garden, he didn't go looking for God after that. No, no, no. He and Eve went and hid in the bushes, but God came looking for them. There's mercy just in the very fact that God loved them too much to simply leave them alone. There's mercy, there's compassion, there's love in the the simple fact that, that, that God got in their business that he sought after them, that he, that he contended with them. Do you notice where he came from? This is important. You say, well, he came from heaven. Mm-mm. According to verse number one, he came up from Gilgal. Now, now, why did he come from there? Now, I remind you that we believe that every word in the Bible is inspired and that, and that every, every word in the Bible is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. In other words, this is not some little passing statement. This is not an insignificant geographical footnote. That There is something we can learn here about Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord, coming up to Bochum from Gilgal. Gilgal is a place mentioned in the Bible on a regular occasion, 39 times if my research is correct. Let me give you four considerations about Gilgal under our first point of we see the compassion of the Lord, the love of the Lord in this text. And in the process, you ought to ask yourself this question and answer this question. Have you, have I left the Lord at Gilgal? In other words, is there a Gilgal in your life? Here's what I mean by that. What in the world, why is Gilgal so important? Why is it mentioned in the text? Well, first of all, Gilgal was a place where salvation was remembered. Perhaps the most well-known place in the Old Testament where this town, Gilgal, is mentioned is in Joshua chapter number 4. You don't have to turn there, but it tells us the story as the children of Israel are finishing their wilderness wanderings, and it's at Gilgal that they stop and camp, and they're prepared to cross over the Jordan. It's at Gilgal. You recall the priest stepped into the chilly Jordan waters with the Ark of the Covenant, and God stopped the waters. And they crossed over. And after they crossed over, they set up some stones of memorial. And they made a promise to future generations. And here's what the promise said in Joshua chapter 4. Listen to verse 20. And those 12 stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. That took place at Gilgal. The hymn writer said, I shall never forget the day. Jesus washed my sins away. Gilgal was a place where salvation was remembered. A memorial was put in place to remind them and their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren how God had had saved them, how God had had moved for them. Uh, Is it possible? Is it possible this morning that I speak to someone that while you perhaps have not forgotten the day and you hadn't forgotten, you know, the fact of the day, But you have forgotten the wonder of that day. Like the Lord calling Jacob back to Bethel, perhaps you need to go back to Gilgal. 
to that place of deliverance, that place of salvation, when your heart was hot for God, when, when tears flowed as, as uh, songs were sung that reminded you of what took place for the salvation of your soul, when the invitation was given, you'd be on your face begging God to save someone. But when, when the sun rose, before you went to work, you were in the Word. Maybe you need to be reminded of that time in your life. Maybe today God needs to visit you from Gilgal, the place where salvation is remembered. But it's not only a place where their salvation is remembered, but Gilgal was a place where, where their submission was revealed. Go back into the wilderness wandering, and for 40 years Israel had not practiced the ritual act of circumcision as they wandered in the wilderness. I'm not going to get into much detail about that, but circumcision was the seal and the sign of, of God's covenant with Israel, with Abraham. And for 40 years, they had just ignored it. And when they crossed the Jordan at Gilgal and Joshua 3 and Joshua 4, they prepared, start preparing for Jericho, a battle that won't take place until Joshua chapter number 6, the, uh, the first major battle, if you will, of the promised land. Well, in between, you have chapter number 5, Joshua chapter 5. And what you'll find in Joshua chapter number 5 is God comes to Joshua and in essence, he says this, Joshua, for 40 years you wandered in the wilderness, and yet you did not observe the sign of my covenant with Father Abraham. None of the men in your kingdom, none of the men in your army have been circumcised. Deal with that. I want the men circumcised. G Gilgal is the place where the nation consecrated, committed themselves to the Lord. Now, by the way, that's not a very good strategic military move. You're about to about to go to, 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 to war with mighty Jericho. Now every man in your army has just been put out of commission for a few days. They're submitted to the word of the Lord, knowing that there is no better way, there is no safer place, there is no more prosperous place than living in submission to what God has told you to do, even when it doesn't make sense to you. Adrian Rogers used to say, just because it doesn't make sense to you doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. And maybe today, my friend, the Lord would visit you from a place where you used to live in submission, where you used to give faithfully, where you used to serve fully, where you used to pray fervently. I recall another hymn writer who said, there's no better way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And the truth of the matter is, if you distrust and you disobey, that is a surefire recipe to be miserable in Jesus. Gilgal was a place that their salvation was remembered, where submission was revealed, but where their shame, their, their reproach was removed. The name Gilgal literally means to roll, like rolling a stone. Matter of fact, listen to Joshua chapter 5, verse number 9. You'll find out why it was named that. It says, And the Lord said to Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach, the shame of Egypt from off of you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. And by the way, it's called that unto this day as well. The, the lack of circumcision made them literally look like the world. There had been a season of disobedience. Then they got things right with God. They repented. They made things right at Gilgal. They spent a season in victory, obediently following the word of God, the commands of God, and lo and behold, you get to Judges chapter number 2, and here we are again. Christ has to come up from Gilgal. In other words, when you get to Judges chapter number 2, this is not the first time that they've been confronted it tells me they're a lot like me. They're a lot like you. Gilgal represents a place of salvation, submission, separation. They'd left the Lord there. But in his compassion and love, we see that he comes back to them. Finally, it was a place where, where sacrifices were to be made. From Joshua chapter 4 all the way through Joshua chapter number 18, the tabernacle stayed at Gilgal. It's where it was, that, that tent, that, that temporary uh, tabernacle before the temple. It was at Gilgal. And considering that Judges chapter number 2 is almost a recap of a lot of the book of Joshua, that is, it kind of flashes back to the life of Joshua, the time described in verse number 6 fits very well with Joshua chapter 16, 17, and the beginning of 18. And if that be the case, it's very, very likely, most Bible scholars agree with this, 
that the events recorded in Judges chapter number 2, that the tabernacle is still at Gilgal. And if that is true, and it seems to be, then it's quite an indictment that our Lord had to go up from Gilgal to meet them. They should have been going down to Gilgal to be at the tabernacle worshiping our Lord. They're like a lot of modern Baptists who come one or two times a month. Their days of sacrifice and service are cold. They're cold. They're indifferent. Uh, I wonder today, if he were to come up from Gilgal, I wonder if he would have to go to the Sunday school class that you used to teach. Or to the kids class that you used to lead. Or or to a seat in a choir that you used to fill. Or to a place as an usher that you used to fill. Or to the door where you used to stand with a smile on your face greeting people as they came into church. If the Lord were to come to you from Gilgal, where would he have to come from? Where would he come from? Would he come from a hospital uh, where, where you knelt by a bedside of a sick loved one and you prayed, Oh God, if you'll intervene, I'll do this. He did, but you didn't. Would he have to, would he come from an altar of prayer at the end of a service or in a revival meeting where you said, God, I'm tired of sinning. God, I'm tired of rebelling. I'm tired of living this way. Lord, I'm I'm coming home and you came home, but you left shortly after. Gilgal is a place of mercy and compassion. We see that in in the fact that he sought after them. We see that in the fact that he spoke to them. Now, we're going to examine what he said in just a moment, but I want to examine the very fact that he spoke to them is all of mercy in and of itself. A year or two ago, I was at a restaurant here in Kingwood that I frequent for lunch on a regular basis. I was standing in the foyer waiting to be seated, and and I saw a man that looked familiar. He had visited our church once, maybe twice. I I didn't even recall his name, unfortunately, and and, uh, don't know him. But I recognized him, recognized that he had been to our church. So I approached him, and I stuck my hand out to shake his hand, said, good to see you. He stared at it and very awkwardly refused to shake my hand. I don't know the man that well, and for the life of me, I couldn't tell you what I've ever done to him. He doesn't know me. And it was a weird, very strange moment. But when I get to portions of Scripture like this one, As mysterious and as weird as that moment was, that a man who doesn't know me, a man that that if I've ever offended him, I don't know it, wouldn't even shake my hand or speak to me. It pales in comparison. It is infinitely more amazing and mysterious that a God who I offend by my very existence, who knows me better than I know myself, who knows everything I've ever said or done or thought, would speak to me at all. Listen to me. Rather than being mad that God is coming to you and getting in your business, stepping on your toes, don't get mad at that. Stop and be thankful that God speaks to you at all. That's mercy. That's mercy. The problem for some of us is not that God hadn't spoken or God won't speak. The problem is most of us just don't like what he has to say. And the worst thing that God could ever do to you is nothing. The worst thing... Anything that he does is soaking wet with the grace of God. Understand this morning that if he comes to you with the, with the sword of the Spirit to cut you, please know this, he is not an intruder with a knife who is trying to harm you and hurt you. He's a great physician who's come with a scalpel to heal you. He is coming in grace and compassion. There's compassion, there's love, there's mercy all over this text. But let's move on to our second point. Notice there is consideration that needs to needs to be made on my part on your part now the opening verses of judges chapter 2 that they're they're really not complicated you don't need a doctorate in old testament theology to figure it out in essence here here it is in a nutshell the lord jesus approached them with a very practical word about some things they need to consider if you do this i'll do that if you don't then this is going to happen now notice the commandments they broke I wonder could it be this morning that you and I need to stop and consider for a moment maybe some principle found in the Word of God, some commandment found in the Word of God that we were breaking. Notice what the Bible says in verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, of course this is Jesus, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I'll never break my covenant with you. And by the way, he didn't. He didn't and he never will. Verse 2, and you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars 
You've not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? This is as plain as black ink on white paper. There were commands against intermingling. There were commands against intermarrying. They violated them for reasons beyond the scope of this sermon we'll get into at a later, later date. But the disobedience here seems to over, overlap with the events recorded in Joshua 15, 16, and 17, as well as Judges chapter number 1 that we read last week. In other words, God told them, destroy the Canaanites, and they didn't do it. God told them not to let them remain in the land. They let them remain in the land. God told them don't intermarry, don't make peace treaties, things like this, and they did. Now, I will readily admit that I don't understand everything there is about all of these ancient covenants that God made with Israel, but my lack of understanding about every little avenue and every little street and every little detail and angle of these ancient covenants just reminds me of the fact that it's not the stuff in the Bible that I don't understand that gets me in trouble with God. It's the stuff in the Bible that I readily and clearly understand that I just flat out refuse to do that gets me in trouble with God. And while I don't have time to go into all their reasons, let me just say this. There is no good reason to disobey the Word of God. God says flee fornication. There's no good reason to disobey that. Not one. God says forsake not the assembling of the saints together. And there's no good reason to disobey that. God says study to show yourself approved unto God. There's no good reason to disobey that. God says don't steal. There's no good reason to disobey that. God says don't covet. There's no good reason to disobey that. God says don't lie. He says set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Friend, our lack of obedience, our lack of obedience is rarely due to a lack of information. Most of the time, it's just because we willfully and deliberately disobey what we know to be right. The commandments they broke. Notice there are consequences that they have to deal with. Notice in verse number 3, Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Life is nothing more than the sum of the choices that you and I make. You, you make your choices. Only problem is you don't get to choose the consequences of your choices. The tribes of Israel let the Canaanites hang around thinking they knew more than God. Their solution to the problem was, well, we're not going to annihilate them. We won't get rid of them. We'll just put them to work. We'll make slaves out of them. And the idea of making the Canaanites Israel slaves, it almost sounds right. But it's completely wrong. As a matter of fact, you'll see throughout this study, throughout the remaining messages of this series, that the tribes of the Canaanites that they let hang around are going to be exactly what the Lord said. They are going to be a thorn in Israel's side throughout. I'm going to make a statement here. You did well to, to heed to this. I do well to heed to this. The spiritual slave that you and I choose to keep today, one of these days will put your descendants in the chains of bondage. We saw that last week, the end of chapter number one. How they made some bad decisions. It didn't necessarily cost them, but when you get to Judges chapter 17, and you read all the wickedness that took place, those are their great, great, great grandchildren. If you keep playing with half-hearted, lukewarm commitment to Jesus, it will come back to bite you. Now, it may not bite you in the hand, and it may not bite you in the leg, but it might bite your kids, and it might bite your grandkids. What I mean by that is that boy that you keep letting hang around that you know doesn't love the Lord. If you don't watch it, he may be raising your grandkids one day. And if he doesn't walk with God, and he doesn't love the Lord, has no relationship with him, it's not going to bode well for the future of your family. The same could be said about a girl. Friend, before chapter number 2, and that's just an example, but before chapter number 2 is over, you have a generation that arises that does not know the Lord. They don't have a clue what God has done for his people. You get to chapter number 3, and Israel is enslaved by the very people God had given them the ability to conquer in chapter number 1. 
Again, this is not complicated theology, Judges chapter number 2. God gave them commands. They disobeyed those commands. Now the Lord comes to confront them in their sin. It's really that simple. There is a compassion of God in this. There's consideration that you and I need to take. And then notice there's confession on their part. Notice in verse number 4, And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochum. And they sacrifice there unto the Lord. Here's the good news. Maybe you're being confronted by the Lord. It's an opportunity for you to confess. There's an opportunity for a confession. And that's where a rebuke can be turned into repentance. Verses 4 and 5 record what I think is the proper response from the people of God. And I know that this response is going to be short-lived. Uh, so short-lived that a lot of Bible commentators question the sincerity of it. I'm not getting into that this morning, but I at least want to give them credit. At least, if they're not sincere, their emotions are right, even if they are just kind of going through the motions. First of all, notice this confession, uh, one that really honors the Lord. Number one, it involves weeping and repentance. Notice in verse 4, it says, The angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. Pretty good response. Notice what they don't do. They don't balk and they don't protest. They don't defend themselves. They don't try to justify their actions. They don't try to find a verse in the Bible that seems to justify their behavior. They don't look at the angel of the Lord and say, well, you're just a legalist. They don't tell him to judge not lest you be judged. They don't say, you who is without sin, cast the first stone. And by the way, that would not be a smart thing to say to Jesus Christ. He is without sin. But most likely, when it comes to you and I, most likely confrontation that comes to you today is going to be through the voice and the ministry of a fellow sinner. Most likely the one, uh, the, the, the confrontation that comes into your life or mine is going to come through the mouth of flesh and blood, a fellow believer who has plenty of sin on their own. But a mature believer is not going to point a finger back at the accuser. Listen to what I'm about to say very carefully. There will be obvious manifestations after the fact if real repentance has taken place. But I am convinced, 100% convinced, that there will be some manifestations during the fact if real repentance is going on. If you and I are genuinely, rightly responding to the confrontation of the Lord, friend, friend our response will not be flippant. And our response is not going to be casual. Uh, when we really respond right to God and the preaching of the Word of God, you won't spend your time during the invitation clicking your ballpoint pen, zipping up your Bible cases, searching for your car keys because you want to beat everybody to Luby's for lunch. And I'm certainly not trying to manipulate an invitation. I wouldn't do that. Hope you know me well enough to know. But when we really respond right to God and the preaching of the Word of God, there'll be more than teenagers and children coming to the altar to get right with God. I don't know what confession looks like for you, but I'm convinced it looks like something. There'll be something showing that it was real. For Israel, it looked like public weeping over their sin, weeping and repentance, and it led to worship and reverence. Notice in verse number 5, and they called the name of the place Bochum, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. Now, again, their obedience seems short-lived, but I can't be too hard on them. I know what that's like. Uh, perhaps it's just me this morning. But I know what it's like to wake up in the morning and pray the same prayer of repentance for the same sin that I prayed the day before. So I don't want to be too hard on them. Their, their obedience seems short-lived. Consequences are going to come anyways. But in this moment, it seems that they do what's right. They build an altar and they sacrifice to the Lord. Bottom line is, and I'm done, they got right with God. And they demonstrated that in an outward way, an obvious way. And that is the only proper response to a confrontation, to a meeting with Jesus. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I really don't know how to give an invitation this morning, if I'm being honest with you. I don't know what the Lord is doing to speak to your heart. I know what he's saying to mine. But I'll just simply say this this morning, that the Lord loves you so much that he's willing to confront you one more time from the pages of sacred scripture. If you're lost this morning, the good shepherd's willing to leave the 99 
and come after the one lost sheep. The great physician knows that, that all the healthy people don't need a physician. But if you're sick in sin, he'll make a house call. He'll come to your door. This morning, if Christ in his grace has spoke to your heart, you ought to respond by coming to him in return. If you're lost, you ought to give your heart to him and know that it's, a, it's an act of grace that God has sought you and has paid the price for your sins to be given. You ought to say yes to him in salvation. Perhaps God has convicted you in an area of your life that you know is wrong, just flat out disobedient. God has come, and as I said, God in your business this morning. You know what you ought to do? You ought to find yourself a place in this altar and say, say, I've wandered far away from God. Lord, I'm coming home. I'm tired of sin. I'm tired of living in disobedience. Your word is clear. And Lord, I'm going to fix that. Lord, I'm coming back to you. Friend, he has come to you. He has come to you. And now it's time for you to come to him. Father, I bow in your presence. Thank you for the word of God. Bless this invitation. Use your word this morning. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. What number, Mark?